Excellent. Uh, welcome, everybody. Fantastic to hear there are so many people interested uh, in this uh, topic from uh, many different countries. Uh, as I said in my uh, uh, abstract, I'm going to model in this uh, presentation uh, what I've developed over a number of uh, years working first of all as an uh, EAL teacher, head of the EAL department and the refugee support coordinator at Haverstock School in London, which is an in a, a London school with a high uh, proportion of children who come from uh, different countries and also uh, at the time when I was working there we had 20% refugee children. Uh, also, uh, I uh, continue developing this work as a uh, Ethnic Minority Achievement Advisor for City of Westminster Council, where I was working with all secondary and primary schools and uh, supporting teachers to uh, develop this type of approach and adapt it to uh, their classrooms and their needs. So uh, during this um, uh, presentation, I will ask you to join in and uh, act as my class and uh, uh, um, give some comments and uh, guess few things that I'm uh, asking you to do. I also have a couple of video links and uh, we've checked and they worked. <laughs> so I hope everything will be fine from that uh, point of view. And yes, please comments, questions in the chat so we can uh, address that later. And, and I'm very happy to be the uh, speaker following up on the fantastic presentation we had a few weeks ago uh, on using a narrative uh, inquiry and narratives in, in research and I will also touch a little bit on uh, narratives in research but uh, the main uh, bulk of this presentation is about engaging with identities uh, as teachers as educators. Uh, so in my different roles uh, as a teacher and uh, um, a consultant advisor to teacher uh, to teachers I uh, experienced that uh, children often found curriculum and, and teaching they were exposed to to be uh, disconnected and irrelevant to their reality. Uh, I was asked to conduct uh, folks discussion groups with students from underachieving groups. So at that time in, in Westminster, we had children uh, who were Bengali speakers, Kurdish speakers, Somali speakers, who were identified as uh, being well below the national average. And uh, in my role uh, of an advisor, I was uh, trying to identify and to consult these children to find out uh, why, uh, uh, you know, uh, the reasons for their uh, underachievement. And often in these focus discussion groups, uh, uh, they would highlight the fact that often they didn't understand why they had to study hard some very difficult texts like, uh, you know, in year seven, everybody has to study Beowulf. Uh, and then later on, they had to study Shakespeare, Macbeth, and children were saying, uh, you know, what, what is the relevance of this to our everyday lives? Uh, and then uh, I came across children who were saying like, oh, uh, Beowulf was the most uh, boring thing we did and we really didn't enjoy it. And then another class of children saying, oh, this was the best unit we did. Uh, and when I was looking into the differences of, of approaches the teachers used, uh, the teacher who was really successful in teaching this unit uh, asked uh, children to uh, write for their homework about heroes from their own communities, their own countries. So she was still covering uh, Beowulf as an important uh, text in English, and they were all engaging uh, uh, with that as a requirement of the curriculum, but uh, uh, she made it uh, personal to children by asking them to uh, contribute stories from their own communities about heroes uh, from, their, from their own countries. And it was excellent to see children uh, contribute uh, stories uh, that were either uh, outlined in, in uh, literature in different countries or in history and being very proud uh, of that contribution. Uh, this, of course, uh, was not only about, uh, you know, getting children to engage in a different way with something that they were finding irrelevant or difficult, but also it uh, contributed to intercultural learning throughout that class and children were able to learn about uh, different communities, languages, histories uh, through the presentations that children made themselves. So really the starting point is uh, that children and adults in any classroom are the most valuable resources that we have. 
and they're often overlooked and underutilized in teaching and learning processes. So uh, my approach is really about exploring ways in which we can use personal narratives to uh, enhance engagement uh, and develop uh, uh, intercultural skills uh, and competencies. So uh, in order to um, support uh, children's engagement, uh, we also need to know our learners. And uh, in a context where you have children arriving from different countries uh, on a weekly basis, which is a uh, uh, you know, case in a global city like London, where you will have midterm arrivals coming throughout the years, uh, where do you come from? Conversation is something that will happen to every child who arrives. Uh, and uh, it will happen very often, especially during uh, their kind of first term in the school. Now, uh, I've observed children uh, having these conversations. And, you know, if you have a child who comes from Brazil, uh, and as soon as they say Brazil, uh, the responses they will get will be, oh, that is such a beautiful country, and you've got amazing footballers and food, and, you know, this child will feel proud uh, because of that. Uh, but if you have a child who says, I come from Syria, the immediate reaction they will get is, oh, I am very sorry. Uh, and th this is, of course, uh, an appropriate reaction, uh, but it is very hard for a child uh, every time he or she says where they come from to, uh, you know, get a reply, uh, I'm sorry, which then leads to uh, somewhat depressing conversations. And uh, uh, I also uh, was uh, working with a child who um, came from Kosovo. And the teachers told me that he was very academically able and that uh, he was doing really well. But every so often he would punch somebody in the playground and they didn't know why this was happening. And obviously he would get excluded for such incidents. Uh, when I uh, spoke to him on one to one basis, he said to me, uh, children ask him where he comes from. And when he says from Kosovo, he often gets, uh, gets a reply, oh, that's not a country. Uh, obviously, for a 14-year-old boy, uh, this was a great insult. And uh, uh, because he didn't have the knowledge to challenge uh, this kind of discourse in the playground, he would opt uh, to, uh, you know, punch uh, uh, somebody who said that. Uh, so uh, we decided that uh, uh, the best way to deal with that was to find him a supplementary school where he could learn about the history of his country and uh, continue developing his language. So I just want to highlight that this very simple uh, question and conversation can uh, lead to very complex uh, interactions in the playground, in the classroom, and this is something that uh, we need to be aware of as educators. Also, uh, uh, we need to, for children coming into secondary schools or uh, kind of uh, upper classes of primary school, uh, these children often already have uh, a lot of experience of education in another country. So we need to have a, an understanding of their expectations in terms of interaction with teachers, uh, in terms of expectations of teaching uh, the language. I often had uh, children from Afghanistan say, Miss, please teach me some grammar. <laughs> and they were quite, uh, you know, uh, uh, th th they felt. Uh, in panic that nobody was really teaching that very explicitly grammar and, and, and this is what they were used to uh, in their home country and this is where they felt secure to be given very explicit grammatical rules they can follow. So just highlighting how important it is to set time aside to have these conversations with children and find out uh, uh, where they come from and uh, what expectations they have. Um, when it comes to structuring autobiographical approaches, obviously there's a lot in literature and uh, you, know, uh, you will find that uh, uh, autobiographical approaches are used a lot. Uh, but uh, for me, working in a school where we had a significant proportion of children from refugee backgrounds, some of them arrived uh, from uh, you know, uh, very bad conflict uh, zones. Uh, some of them arrived uh, without knowing where uh, members of their family were or as an, an accompanied minor, uh, really asking them uh, to write uh, you know, narratives about their family, their experience uh, was very sensitive. 
and uh, often also intimidating. So I was trying to find a way into autobiographical narratives uh, which wouldn't uh, really uh, cause uh, intimidation. Uh, so uh, I was interested in how to provide opportunities for children to tell their own narrative, uh, which will challenge stereotypes that are, uh, can be imposed by the curriculum and, and often media. And also I wanted to uh, develop this work in a way uh, to make sure that every child in that classroom, uh, regardless if they are coming from a different country or they were born uh, in that uh, uh, community where the school is, that they were developing their intercultural competencies and uh, learning from one another. Also, uh, I've learned very quickly when I started working in a multicultural environment that there will be difficult issues that will come up, uh, especially when it comes to interpretations of history interpretations of uh, you know, world events that uh, we all address uh, in our different cur curriculums. And uh, also, I think it's very important uh, that we, uh, you know, um, that we are aware of this and that we think in advance how we address these difficult issues that will uh, come up in our classrooms. Also, uh, how do we learn from the past and uh, kind of not read repeat the cycle that leads to some children feeling their languages are not valued enough, uh, which then leads to a, a loss of language of culture. This is uh, obviously addressed in my research, as Jim said, uh, my research is in attitudes to bilingualism and this kind of uh, a loss of language of culture at the individual level is something that uh, I address uh, in my research. So here is something that presented itself to me uh, in a very unexpected way uh, when I was uh, supporting uh, a, a new arrival, uh, a child who came from China, uh, and, and this was in a secondary school in a history lesson, history teacher, obviously my colleague and, and a friend. And uh, this uh, worksheet was presented uh, where you are actually comparing democratic societies, societies based on fascist ideology and also on communist ideology. Uh, and you can see this child took this worksheet home and translated everything into uh, Mandarin and uh, maybe even got help from his parents. Uh, now, what I find really difficult here, problematic here, is that in that classroom, we had children from Russia, from Poland, from former Yugoslavia, from China, obviously. And when you go through this worksheet, uh, the conclusion it leads you is that there is a lot of similarity between fascism and communism. Uh, now, uh, you know, I, I come from a country where uh, the the fight against fascism, against Nazi occupation, was led by the Communist Party. Uh, and uh, I think that this is very difficult to negotiate for children who come uh, from countries where uh, this was the case. And uh, uh, I also felt that this was very difficult for me to address with the history teacher. Uh, and uh, I was trying to think of that different ways in which I can uh, address this. And this is how I started thinking about uh, doing autobiographical narratives where children can present their own stories and talk about their own identities and where they come from and systems of value that they have. So to give a counterbalance to something that's presented uh, in the curriculum, uh, in a lesson where, uh, you know, uh, they might be surprised with certain interpretations. I think it's very important that give them opportunities to present uh, their, uh, uh, their views and their identities in a different way. Uh, so I will also tell you about theoretical underpinnings of this work. Uh, I am um, using uh, James Cummings theories and particularly uh, his framework for developing of academic expertise. Uh, you can see here in this central uh, uh, part of the diagram that he's putting teacher-students interaction uh, as uh, the center of it. And then you've got two principles. One is maximum cognitive engagement. Uh, we know that it's a big struggle for children who are coming to secondary school, for example, 
and who are new to English uh, to give them work that's appropriate uh, for their uh, cognitive uh, level of development. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes we see practice where children are given things to copy. And obviously this, this is not what we what is considered by maximum cognitive engagement. Maximum identity investment uh, in this uh, uh, diagram is equally important. And here Jim Cummings talks about uh, creating conditions where children build on what they know and what they have. Uh, and making sure that prior experiences are not dismissed, but they are allowed in to become a foundation stone uh, for the current and future experiences and learning. And this is not only important for children who are coming from different countries. Uh, this is also about uh, affirmation of different class of regional and uh, individual identities. So this really applies to everybody in our classroom. Um, also, I'm looking at the model that's been developed by Finkbeiner and Copland, which is known as HBC model, which includes autobiographical, biographical narratives and cultural analysis. And then later on, B was added uh, for dialogue. So uh, really, it's about sharing autobiographical narratives, looking at differences and commonalities in our experiences, uh, and having this cultural analysis and dialogue uh, uh, about these different features that we notice. So in terms of the model that I've developed, uh, these are my starting points at the classroom level. Uh, I was uh, very focused on developing a model which um, actually uh, engages with the balance of power between uh, children and adults, so developing collaborative classroom. Uh, I felt that uh, asking children to share uh, their own narratives without us as teachers and educators sharing our own narratives. Uh, it's not really, uh, you know, providing conditions to develop a collaborative classroom. Uh, therefore, my model starts uh, with the teacher providing his or her own narrative. And also this narrative acts as a model that, that children use to develop their, their own narratives. Uh, and when I work with schools as an advisor uh, and teachers uh, want to uh, uh, use this model, I always tell them, okay, but the condition is that you will also have to share your narrative as a model. Uh, and uh, this is uh, something that, uh, uh, you know, I will address before uh, later in terms of how teachers react to this. But uh, the point of um, really doing these narratives is to experience diversity and cultures in a very personal way. So as again, a complement to what we study in the curriculum, which is the official narrative uh, of the a particular historical events, here we are providing a personal uh, way into this. Um, my model uses multimedia elements, and I think this is very important in terms of uh, engagement uh, to make this narrative uh, really uh, engaging through use of photographs, use of poetry, literature, uh, video clips, uh, and, you know, thinking again about uh, learners who are new to English, this is, of course, all very supportive if, uh, you know, we are making sure that there are visual elements of it. Uh, another important point about this uh, model is that there's encouragement of bilingual expression, written and spoken. So children are encouraged to make posters uh, with their narratives and they can put texts obviously in English and then if they're literate in their first language or other languages, they are encouraged to uh, do it also in their other languages. Also, uh, uh, Spoken presentation is the highlight of this work. And, you know, I had teachers who told me that that was the first time that the child had actually spoken in front of the classroom, whole classroom. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's very exciting for children uh, to present their work uh, in front of the whole class. Sometimes we invite the head teacher, the governors, and we give a real sense of occasion to these children presenting. Uh, their narratives. And, uh, uh, you know, I had teachers who, who told me that later on children were asking when they were going to present again, and uh, they really enjoyed being given that kind of level of, of attention. 
Also, I worked with schools where they've done this project across the whole year group, uh, such as in, in Redbridge in London, and we had an exhibition of their posters in the local uh, shopping center so that wider uh, uh, members of the community could uh, uh, engage uh, with the narratives of these children through their posters. Uh, so the focus is on having this kind of genuine audience for uh, what these children have to share uh, with uh, uh, their peers and also with adults. And engaging children and adults in the community, so giving adults teachers teaching assistants, head teachers, also opportunity to present their narrative. It's important in terms of developing trust and also uh, developing ways of learning from each other about our diversity. Okay, so I mentioned before that uh, because I was very conscious that, uh, you know, in the learning community where I was working, there were lots of children who uh, could be very sensitive about talking about their families. I wanted to find a way into narratives which takes the spotlight off, uh, you know, families. And uh, I decided to focus on places. So this project is called Places. And uh, it can be places we had to leave because this is a, a common human experience that we all had to leave a place, even if we didn't move down, so we all had to leave primary school to go into a secondary school. Uh, but also it could be places we want to go to if somebody, some of the children want to focus on uh, some uh, a future place that they're dreaming of. And, and I had a group of children in Redbridge who did a, a project on the Utopia Island, uh, the way things would look if children were in charge and how they imagined that. But mostly uh, children choose to focus on a place that's important to them in terms of uh, you know, their origins or perhaps place where they live uh, now. In. And uh, when you think about places, cities, you know, they're in integral ingredients of our identities. They, they shape who we are. And it's also a way in which we can connect our personal narratives with bigger historical narratives. So when you think about children in you know, primary, secondary school, uh, sometimes they feel they don't have much to say about their relatively short experience. Uh, but if they can tap into bigger historical narratives that are connected to a place that's important to them, uh, then they will have much richer uh, 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 content to uh, tap into and, and to present. And as I already said, this is a way of kind of taking off the spotlight of what might be traumatic or sensitive family uh, history. So uh, I'm going to tell you now about my own special place. Uh, and this is a city called Sarajevo. And here is a... Well, for some reason, I can't move to the next slide. And this is very strange. Um, Jim, <laughs> have you had this before? Oh, hey, here. Okay, I don't know why it was blocked. Okay, so uh, th this is a photo of, of Sarajevo and uh, this particular vista is uh, very dear to me. Uh, this is because I uh, lived in a house by this first bridge that you see on the left side, and uh, I was looking at uh, the building that you see on the right. So uh, what I ask children to contribute here is to tell me if they've heard of Sarajevo, if they know where it is, and uh, you know what they know about it. So uh, do I have anybody brave who wants to contribute and tell me what they know about Sarajevo? Okay, Jim, can you hear me? Is everything okay? Hello? Nathan, can you hear me? Dina, Dina, we can hear you. Um, I can yeah, hear you. Everything's fine. I just think people don't have a lot to contribute right now. <laughs> I, um, okay. I can say something about Sarajevo. Oh, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> so I've been to Sarajevo about three times. 
Um, but I, I also know it's the place where Archduke Ferdinand was killed the, or just at the outbreak of, before the outbreak of the First World War. And there's a plaque to that effect just around the corner from one of those buildings. I'm not too sure which side of the, which direction you're looking at. I also know there's a very nice little um, tea shop or a little, little restaurant uh, just by the river there, which is one of my favorite places. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's, very, it's a very um, bustling uh, young city nowadays. A um, lot of nightlife, a lot of very lively. It's, I, I love it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jane. Yes, uh, Sarajevo uh, is known to people as kind of the place where the First World War was triggered by the assassination of uh, Archduke Ferdinand. And uh, uh, yes, uh, there is a sign, it's the second bridge which is called uh, uh, Gavro Princip Bridge, and Gavro Princip is the young man who assassinated uh, Archduke Ferdinand. Uh, and on that bridge, uh, there are uh, steps, footsteps in the stone uh, where we think that he stood when he assassinated Archduke Ferdinand. Now, again, this is a very interesting moment in history for different interpretations, uh, because obviously uh, this could be interpreted as a terrorist attack. Uh, uh, also, uh, it can be interpreted as a, a you know, a, an act of heroism, because um, this particular event uh, ended uh, the uh, Austro-Hungarian occupation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and uh, Gavro Princip was only 19 years old. He belonged to a, a group of uh, young people who uh, had as their ideal for Bosnia and Herzegovina to become a free country. And uh, um, this was kind of the way that uh, they uh, wanted to make that happen. Uh, this event uh, triggered uh, uh, the First World War. Uh, Sarajevo uh, was also uh, a lot in the news in the 90s uh, because uh, in the war that happened in former Yugoslavia, uh, it was uh, um, under constant shelling uh, and it was in a siege for more than 1,000 days. Uh, and lots of people were killed during that siege, and I will say something uh, more about it. Uh, moving on, oh God, <laughs> I don't know why it's uh, giving me trouble to move on my slides. Try a different way, are you using your keyboard? Yes, okay, I move. yes, I'm using my keyboard. So uh, my first element that I want to share with you is a soundtrack to a TV series and uh, uh, this was a TV series shown in former Yugoslavia when I was just at the beginning of starting school. Uh, it was as popular in Yugoslavia as uh, EastEnders are now in England. So adults and children would watch it and uh, uh, then we would play out the scenes from this series uh, in the playground. So uh, when I uh, uh, the series was so popular that one of the um, kind of uh, our rock bands called Zabraneno Pushenje, which means forbidden smoking, uh, then issued a, an album where this theme was uh, used as an uh, introduction theme, and I'm going to play that for you now. This is also another vista of Sarajevo. Um, and uh, when I play this soundtrack to you, I would like you to pay attention to languages that you are going to hear. Uh, you are going to hear two languages and I'd like you to identify, if you can, uh, what they are and perhaps if you are able to tell me what these people say. Uh, also, uh, I would like you to tell me, uh, just judging by the sentiment of, uh, that the music communicates, uh, what you think this TV series is about. Okay. On the middle of the British guy. Merkwürdig. Seit ich in Sarajevo bin, suche ich weiter und finde. Jetzt, wo ich gehen muss, weiß ich, wer er ist. 
Sie wissen, wer Walter ist? Sagen Sie mir sofort seinen Namen. Ich werde ihn Ihnen zeigen. Sehen Sie diese Stadt? Das ist Walter. Okay, so uh, anybody wants to tell me uh, about the languages they heard? Oh, sorry. Oh, a couple of people are saying German. We've got comments from yes, okay. Catherine and Gwyneth. Gwyneth says he said something about extraordinary or remarkable, but I couldn't catch what exactly. <laughs> Okay, so uh, probably in terms of what the music communicates something about remarkable happenings, extraordinary people. Okay, anybody else? Languages or the sentiment that music contributes, uh, communicates. Sarah says she also heard German. Uh, Helen says, need to listen again to get a translation. <laughs> Sorry, Got jetzt and Zweiten. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, so okay, uh, basically at the beginning you just have a couple of words uh, said in our language, then called Zebra Croat, and now people call it Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian. So, on that glad I love Chino. Uh, uh, please look here, I love Chino, is somebody who fights like a lion. Uh, and then uh, uh, you have uh, two, uh, basically, what you see in the TV series, it's two German officers standing on the hills there on the side, uh, looking at Sarajevo in the valley. And uh, one of the German officers is being demoted because he couldn't capture the leader of the Communist Party, the leader of the resistance uh, called Walter. And the series is called Walter Defense Sarajevo. And this new officer who comes to take over, uh, Sarajevo says to the one who's leading, so can you tell me anything? Can you tell me uh, one name? How am I going to find uh, Walter. Uh, and the officer who is leading says, look at this city, this whole city is Walter, you will never find him. And uh, sorry, I get so emotional about that. So. <laughs> uh, Understandably. And yes, <laughs> uh, yes uh, Sarajevo absolutely uh, was uh, never fully conquered. And uh, uh, the, the, the Communist Party put on an uh, uh, amazing, extraordinary uh, struggle against the Nazis there. Uh, obviously, lots of people got killed uh, in that uh, fight. And now in the city center, you can see what we call the eternal fire, the flame that says that uh, uh, that always burns and commemorates all the people who uh, fought against Nazis in the Second uh, World War. Uh, and, uh, you know, for us as children, uh, we all wanted to be Walter and his men and women, and this is what we played uh, in the playground. And uh, we were wearing, uh, you know, the hats with uh, uh, red stars, and this was something that was part of our childhood. Uh, so uh, I know when I presented this work in uh, Hong Kong at the conference for uh, uh, international schools, I had colleagues from Russia, from Kazakhstan, who came and said to me, we were also, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of playing games like that, and, and we like that you talk about it. Uh, sorry, I just now need to uh, move to my next slide, and that's <laughs> so making things difficult. Yeah. Some interesting, some okay. nice some comments, Dina, in the chat. So um, Dylan says that the music suggested triumph or resilience. Um, and Jane had mentioned something about showing something, so I was asking for a name. Helen says Spartacus. <laughs> yes, okay, all correct. Yeah, German, <laughs> give, give me a name, okay? A name. Here, here, what I share with children is a, a, a photograph. Uh, this is my class when I was uh, a first uh, a grade, six years old. 
uh, I'm here in white, uh, and this is just uh, after we uh, became pioneers. And again, many uh, uh, people from socialist countries will share this element in their education that uh, during the first uh, grade, they will be admitted officially into the society by becoming pioneers. Uh, and we did that on the 29th of November, which was the birthday of the Republic of Yugoslavia when uh, Yugoslavia was formed. And uh, uh, we had to give an oath. Uh, and that oath said, um, I uh, give my word of honor that I will learn and study hard, that I will respect my teachers and adults and children, uh, that I will uh, not lie and not steal, and that I will defend my country. Uh, and obviously, these are very important words and important oath. All our parents came to see us uh, uh, you know, give our oath. And you can see here in the photograph, uh, we are all serious and we've got presents. Uh, and this is kind of an important uh, part that communicated the value system uh, of the country where we lived. So uh, again, you know, thinking about that worksheet that uh, I showed you first in the history lesson, this is kind of a counterbalance of presenting a narrative uh, like this. Uh, and I want to here now uh, give you a wider uh, reflection on how we still actually use narratives from the Second uh, World War, even from the First World War, to connect uh, with living in history right now. And I've identified a lot of that happening uh, when uh, the UK was engaging with uncertainty and anxiety around Brexit. I think that it's not a coincidence that six months after it was announced that Brexit was going to happen, the film that came out was Churchill. And in this film, uh, Churchill is shown as a very kind of, uh, leader exhausted by the war, uh, trying to think very hard through uh, uh, you know, important decisions that he had to make. And these decisions uh, were leading uh, towards D-Day, which is uh, obviously uh, one of the most important battles of the Second World War. Closely followed uh, the film Dunkirk, uh, which is about over 300,000 uh, British soldiers uh, and also uh, some uh, French and Belgian soldiers standing here on the beach in Dunkirk. Uh, they are waiting for their death or for a miracle to save them. And uh, uh, here we see uh, uh, one of the posters was the little boats uh, that uh, were then employed to come and rescue uh, these soldiers. And this was a very uh, important and successful mission. The film that followed that was The Darkest Hour, which actually shows uh, Churchill during these uh, 48 hours leading to D-Day uh, and kind of what he was negotiating. Uh, and there's an excellent scene for people who haven't seen this film, I, I highly recommend it, where Churchill is hiding in the toilet, so he's hiding from all his uh, uh, cabinet and, and men around him. Uh, and he's talking to the US president, uh, begging him to send the planes that uh, Britain already paid for. And uh, the US president saying, well, we can't send you the planes because we've signed this disarmament agreement and so on. And, but he says, if you bring horses to the Canadian border, you can actually draw the planes over the border and then fly from Canada. And, and Churchill is uh, completely outraged by this suggestion and, and he's shouting horses, are you saying horses? And he just throws the phone, he marches out of uh, his uh, hiding uh, spot in the toilet. He goes and calls his uh, first general, this was like two o'clock in the morning, and he says, everybody who has a small boat needs to be called. Everybody's going to Dunkirk. And the general says, trying to kind of uh, a talk against it and the church of the shots, this is an order. Uh, and he puts down the phone and then the next thing is 80, 850 uh, uh, small boats are going to Dunkirk to, to rescue the soldiers. Uh, and this shows again what we are seeing in, in Brexit discourse about small businesses and kind of uh, uh, saving the day for the British economy, but also I think this is a quest to find a charismatic leader like Churchill 
uh, to you know uh, lead Britain out of uh, uh, this uh, what everybody's fearing uh, you know uh, hard Brexit and, and what that's going to do uh, to our economy. So I think these kind of uh, historical narratives are, are still very current and alive and they are used for people to develop uh, new ways of engaging with, with current history. My second element uh, is uh, uh, photographs of a landmark place. So I show children this photograph and I ask them to guess uh, what this building might have been. They can see this building uh, has been uh, badly damaged. So I ask them to guess what this building might have been. Uh, can I ask uh, people to have a guess? From Katerina, the, the guess is a library. Okay, any other guesses? Uh, from Nicole, a palace. Okay. From Dylan, a cathedral. Okay. Uh, a few more, cathedral. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, this was a building that was built by the Austro-Hungarian Empire and originally it was the town hall. And then later it became, uh, it's like the equivalent to the British National Library, it's the uh, Bosnia National Library, where many uh, manuscripts, original uh, and unique manuscripts were housed in, uh, uh, in the archives. This uh, building was strategically targeted from the beginning of the siege in the 90s. You can see here damage to the right wing, it was constantly shelled. Uh, and then uh, this is when it was uh, set on fire. Uh, this building was, um, uh, we lost in that fire many important documents and especially manuscripts uh, that are the evidence uh, to uh, independent Bosnian kingdom uh, in the medieval times, which is obviously a historic evidence important for uh, the current claim to uh, the independence of Bosnia and Herzegovina and its statehood. Uh, so uh, this building was very important to me. Uh, you saw it on the first photograph as kind of the vista that I saw from my own flat and it was uh, on my way to university. Uh, so uh, the personal meaning of this uh, library is also that I did important work on completing my um, dissertation on the history of the uh, teacher education in Bosnia and Herzegovina and I was given special permission to go into the archives and retrieve documents that were more than 100 years old which were the evidence of setting up a teacher education in our country and uh, here the building is uh, renewed uh, it was uh, refurbished by the help of the Austrian government uh, and there in the corner uh, that, that's me uh, visiting Sarajevo 25 years after I, I left uh, in 92. I somehow felt uh, I couldn't go until uh, uh, the library was refurbished because, uh, you know, losing a library like that, seeing it as a ruin uh, was like, uh, you know, losing a, a human being. It was so unique. It was so important to our history and, and it was a a huge and very painful loss to all of us, but it's a fantastic now to, to see it renewed. Uh, and we, when we were there, uh, there was an excellent uh, exhibition of a, uh, a famous painter, Mersad Berber, uh, and that's how it looks inside. So what you saw in the first uh, picture as the ruins, this is now beautifully refurbished. Uh, now, uh, this, uh, this element also uh, lends itself to uh, talking about cultural genocide, uh, which was one of the features of the war in uh, former Yugoslavia. Uh, obviously, this building had no uh, value in terms of infrastructure. Uh, this was targeted especially to, you know, uh, destroy the kind of historical evidence and also, uh, obviously, in terms of the moral defeat, this was uh, something that was uh, very hurtful to people. Uh, who uh, felt, who stayed there and uh, who uh, voted for independent Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, 
again, by the reflection on what's happening now, uh, you know, you can be looking at cultural genocide and current uh, uh, destruction of world and uh, uh, national heritage sites. And you can be looking at that through political conflicts, but also processes like climate change. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many of us followed what was happening to Palmyra site and uh, uh, how tragic that was to see uh, that site uh, uh, damaged. Uh, then we know that uh, uh, Trump removed the status of the National Park in Utah, uh, which endangered some of the cultural sites uh, of American Indians uh, uh, there. And also we know all what's happening to coral uh, reefs through uh, uh, because of the climate change. So all these connections could be made through, uh, uh, you know, points that are made uh, here about this library. Uh, my third element is to uh, talk about people and children from a particular city, which kind of uh, give a particular mark to that city, uh, in the same way that uh, places make us who we are, also people and children living their shape, shape the city. So um, I show uh, children this photograph and I ask them uh, where they think this person is, uh, and what kind of emotion he's communicating. So uh, anybody wants to say uh, something here? While I'm waiting for the things to appear on the chat, I can just say that there have been some really nice reflections on the, the beauty of the library. Um, <laughs> it was really nice to see. Uh, Gwyneth has commented, in a cemetery, deep grief. Deep grief, correct, yes. Uh, this is a cellist, veteran smiler, which is known as cellist of Sarajevo. Uh, he's somebody who stayed in Sarajevo during the war, but uh, refused to, uh, you know, join any army, and uh, he wanted to continue his presence there as a musician. So what he did, he would put on a concert attire, you can see him here wearing most beautiful concert attire that he used to wear when he performed uh, at the Opera House. And uh, uh, he would go and play in cemeteries for the victims. Uh, there was also a very famous incident where um, people waiting in the bread line were shelled and uh, 18 victims uh, happened uh, you know, in one day, uh, just civilians waiting in the bread line. And uh, he went and played for 18 days at the same time when the shell fell uh, for uh, the 18 people who were killed there. Uh, so uh, he is somebody who became also a, a symbol of undefeated Sarajevo that, you know, uh, he wanted with his music uh, to bring people together. He would go and play on the, uh, on the front lines for the soldiers. He'd play in the graveyards at, at the scenes of uh, great massacres. Uh, he also became um, the symbol of a Sarajevo festival uh, in the winter of 93. So this was in the depth of the war uh, where uh, Sarajevo was under siege and the only way out of Sarajevo was through a tunnel. Uh, and uh, obviously nobody was coming in, but uh, the festival of experimental theater was something that's very important to the city and people who stayed decided to keep it going with, uh, you know, musicians and artists who were there. So uh, this was the poster for um, Sarajevo 93 and, and this festival. So again, it's uh, Vedran expressing his grief and uh, tragedy in uh, the ruins of the National Library. Uh, and when I work with younger children, I tell them about uh, Zlatan's diary. This was, uh, uh, a diary written by a girl from Sarajevo, was so very uh, similar to Anna Frank's diary. Uh, uh, so this girl uh, lived during the war with her parents in Sarajevo and she wrote down uh, her experiences and uh, her sentiments about what was going on. And then it was uh, later on published. Uh, and as you can see, it, it became a bestseller and something that's uh, used a lot across schools, uh, again, uh, you know, giving children insights into uh, experiences of children uh, living in Sarajevo during the war. 
Uh, my fourth element is, uh, you know, using a poem uh, that was published uh, in a bilingual uh, book. And this is where I encourage children to bring literature stories, poems from their own cultures, uh, and especially if they are uh, if they're published as bilingual texts. So uh, this is uh, the book that uh, I treasure very highly. It's called Stone Sleeper. Uh, and uh, it's written by one of our famous poets, Mark Dista. Uh, I was at the launch of this translation and the book was translated by Francis Jones, who is a Cambridge scholar. And he said at uh, this launch that, he said, it took me 10 years uh, to find my stone sleepers. Uh, and that really uh, shows how um, complex it is to translate poetry. And it's really not translation, it's rediscovering that kind of uh, uh, way of poetic expression in another language. Uh, and it takes a long time. So uh, in this book, what you have uh, is uh, poetry that's uh, written side by side. Uh, one a side is in uh, Azerbaijan, one is in uh, Bosnian, and the other side is in English. So uh, this is excellent for children who want to be looking at comparing and contrasting uh, expressions uh, in English and their first language. And for me, this was the first book I had uh, as a bilingual book uh, in the language I used. So a uh, very important uh, a gift uh, that was given to me. And I'm so pleased I was able to uh, go to the launch. Now. Uh, in the class with children, I would uh, ch read children this uh, poem in English. And uh, then what happens uh, is the children will very spontaneously ask uh, for me to read this uh, poem in, in my language. And, uh, you know, often these children uh, don't speak that language, but they say, Miss, we want to hear how it sounds. And, uh, you know, the children have this natural curiosity uh, to hear other languages, to find about other languages. And also, if I do it as a teacher, that, uh, you know, kind of provides space for them and invitation for them that they will also read uh, in their own language. Uh, Jim, since you are the host, uh, do I read uh, the poem? Do we have time for that? Or shall I just leave it at this? I think we would love to hear it. You'd love to hear the poem. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, this book, I said, is called Stone Sleepers and um, is based on uh, the tombs of uh, Bosnian medieval knights. So this is from the period when uh, Bosnia was an independent kingdom and uh, it had its own uh, religion, uh, which was uh, a, a religion uh, that uh, was known as Bogomili and basically it was uh, linked to nature and uh, uh, admired, you know, many different gods that existed in nature. This was, of course, <laughs> you know, the reason for Bosnia to be constantly under attack uh, from the West by, you know, established Catholic Church, uh, but also from uh, the East by the, uh, you know, Ottoman Empire. And uh, eventually uh, Bosnia spent 500 years as a colony of the Ottoman Empire. So, uh, uh, the poem is called Message, and it is like a message of, uh, uh, you know, medieval knights sleeping under one of those uh, uh, tombs to uh, generations of today. So this is what it says, Message. You'll come one day at the head of an armored column from the north and reduce my city to rubble, smugly saying to yourself, now it is raised and raised its faithless faith. But then you'll be amazed to hear me walking through the city again, quietly stalking you again. And secret and sly as a Western spy, you burn my home to the ground till all fall. And then you say these dark words, this nest is done for now. This cursed cur is slain with pain. But by a miracle, I will still be dreaming here on earth. And like a wise watchman from the East, forbidding others to dream and think, you pull poison into the spring from which I drink. And you laugh, you roar that I am no more. 
you know nothing about the town in which I dwell. You have no idea about the house in which I eat. You know nothing about the icy well from which I drink. A meddler from the south disguised as a peddler, you hack my vineyard back to the root so that beneath my poor feet there'll be less shade and deeper chasms. And every home will know famine's spasms. And from afar, I'll let it be told, this truth of mine, unerring and old. You know nothing about the sign of the husbandman for his vine. You don't know what such gifts are worth. Ye my stay on the solid earth is nasty and short. By destroying the true shapes it takes, you only confirm it, whether it sleeps or whether it wakes. In the end, you are the hardest guard, God's strictest inquisitor, bloody to the eyes, desperate, frenzied from battles for dead and living chattels. You burn me, I know, at the end of the show. You burn me, I know, at your divine, your shining state which is already rising inside you. And on your awesome, awful scaffold, I shall not shift. I shall be steadfast as a standing stone till you have done your task and your flame has done its work. Such an end will glorify your threefold cry. Amen, amen, amen. In my place, ashes will lie and for them, women will fly. But therefore, after me, on the first stone head, a message of flowers will still remain in blossoming strands from good and bloody hands. When thy world like at night unto its desire, know then that even his body was about but a moment's home. Therefore thou took only his body into thy keeping, for that body was only his prison and his weeping. How often must I tell you that you know nothing about me? Nothing about my arrow and bow, nothing about my sword and shield, that you have no idea how sharp is my steel, that you know nothing about my poor body or the bright flame that burns inside. I'm waiting for you because I know you. You'll come back one day. This you vowed by chalice and cross and blade of sword, drunk with chance of damnation and incense smoke. So, come on then, I've long grown used to your ravages as if to the throes of a disease from far away, as to the icy waters swept savagely along by this night river of darkness that grows ever more swift and strong. Okay, so that, that is the message in English. Uh, and I'll just read you first two verses in our language, so just that you get the, uh, the sense of the sound. Poruka. Doći ćeš jednog dana na čelu okopnika sa sjevera i srušiti do temelja moj grad. Blažen u sebi veliči, uništen je on sad i uništena je nevjerna njegova vjera. Ok, so uh, this really serves to uh, encourage children to bring similar works of literature and poetry into the classroom and to share it uh, uh, in English and in different languages. And if they haven't got bilingual books, then I tell them to, uh, you know, provide a gist of the story, gist of the poem uh, in English so that we can understand what it is about and they can present, uh, you know, the full version uh, in their own language. Uh, so very important is to encourage uh, biliteracy, to encourage children to write their own uh, uh, bilingual texts, to use every opportunity in terms of homework to encourage children to uh, write homework in uh, both of their languages and also to appreciate skills which are needed for a uh, translation uh, of literature. And moving on, I come to my uh, final fifth element. Uh, and uh, this is basically a, a track, a video clip uh, made by Sarajevo surrealists. Uh, Sarajevo surrealists were uh, something like Monty Python in England. Uh, they uh, created comedy uh, before the war and, uh, you know, if you were a teenager growing up in the 80s, 
you really had to watch every single episode and uh, engage with their radio programs because when you you know went out to meet your friends everybody was uh, talking about what they did in their previous episode and uh, it was a very uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek very politically engaged humor and they were commenting on uh, you know all the different uh, um, changes uh, that were happening in the political landscape a very talented group of actors uh, and uh, musicians and uh, here you can see from one episode uh, many uh, months uh, if not a couple of years before the war started in Sarajevo uh, they had uh, just as Berlin Wall was coming down in Berlin uh, they predicted that there would be a, a war in Sarajevo uh, dividing uh, Sarajevo on east and west Sarajevo uh, at that time, uh, you know, nobody could see this coming uh, when this episode came out. Uh, but actually, nowadays, uh, we do have West and East Sarajevo. They use different scripts. They have different reg plates, different police force. They belong to different parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it, Sarajevo is very much a divided city. We do not have a wall, but uh, there is a marked border between uh, East and West Sarajevo. So uh, tragically, they, they were, uh, you know, accurate in their predictions of uh, what was going to happen in that city. Uh, the clip I'm going to play uh, is from one of their episodes that they uh, filmed during uh, the war in the 90s. So they stayed in Sarajevo and they were filming, they continued filming comedy. And this was very important uh, for people who stayed there, but also for people who left to have this kind of engagement with reality through uh, their lens of humor. And what you're going to see in this clip, uh, they, they'll be singing in our language, but I will uh, translate for you. Uh, basically, they imagined uh, John Lennon being trapped in Sarajevo with Yoko Ono <laughs> in the siege. And uh, uh, John Lennon is obviously trying to create music and uh, uh, Yoko Ono is complaining about many things. So uh, I will now play that clip. Oh, Jim, we tested this and now I have problems. Aha, uh -huh, here it is. Okay. Has that opened up in another window? No. So that's your corner. And these are people, citizens, who are there on their balconies. So this is the version of Imagine. And saying, imagine people stop doing politics. You can see on the walls, there's lots of damage from shelling. Imagine we can go for a coffee. Imagine we had trees again, because all the trees were cut down for fuel. Imagine we have public transport. Imagine we can go and watch football. Imagine we can go out and uh, enjoy coffee and car. Imagine we can demonstrate. And you can see your corners planting food to survive. And all her kind of little sections of the gardens are called by troubled countries, Afghanistan, India. You can 
see how very thin all the people are because obviously there was lack of food. And you can say I've gone mad, but uh, you can't take my dreams away. If we have no food, no electricity, you cannot take my dreams away. And then she says, beautiful song, but you need to make some money and go and get humanitarian aid. In Bosnian, uh, we say let it be, which means hurry up. And that becomes fun on let it be. Okay, so... Uh, I showed this clip because uh, I want to finish on a positive note. I'm, I'm very aware that my presentation is going to be very heavy going for children, but also uh, showing that humor connects uh, people across cultures. You can see here somebody who is a world famous British singer, uh, you know, featuring in, in a video in Sarajevo and uh, showing humor as a tool for developing resilience and uh, a way to connect creatively to our environment, our circumstances uh, and, uh, and other people too. So I encourage them to also find examples of uh, humor from their own cultures that uh, they can share with everybody. Uh, so that is the end of, uh, you know, showing you my model and what I present to children. Obviously I adapted if I'm with younger children with, uh, you know, teenagers, with uh, uh, students in the sixth form, but uh, you know, th this is kind of the main gist of it. Uh, and I'll just show you uh, examples of children's work, posters that they produced and presentations they gave. This is in a year school in a very diverse uh, inner London school. Uh, so uh, this child here presented their um, family history. So uh, this child decided to focus on family history. And uh, he wrote about his uh, great uncle being actually a roommate with Stalin. Uh, you know, when you imagine <laughs> the, the kind of history that we have in our classroom, so many famous people sought asylum in the UK, and, uh, you know, you, you have children, grandchildren now reflecting uh, on uh, what their predecessors did, and this was somebody who was then uh, even in Stalin's cabinet and then ended up in Siberia. Uh, members of this family also joined liberation uh, um, party in France. Uh, this was a Jewish family and uh, this uh, child uh, presented, uh, um, you know, photos taken from history books from uh, Jewish ghettos and, and he talked about uh, what his uh, family uh, experienced in Jewish ghettos. And he said that uh, often he heard bits of stories uh, uh, talked about when there's family gathering, but he said he never really put together uh, what happened to his family until uh, he did this project and that it kind of uh, connected all, all those uh, little stories and bits and pieces that uh, he was hearing during uh, family gatherings. So this is obviously also very important work in terms of children uh, finding out uh, bigger knowledge about their, their family histories. Uh, his uh, actually best friend sitting with him is a child uh, who was partly German, and he decided to take Hamburg as his special place. Uh, this child already had GCSE in German, even though he was only year six. Uh, and uh, he, on this side, uh, uh, that, that's his family in German, and this uh, young girl is his grandmother, and she's actually wearing here Hitler's uniform, uh, Hitler's youth uniform. Now, when I came in, uh, I came in for children's presentations and I saw the posters lined up 
uh, I was worried how this was going to go uh, in the presentations. Uh, the teacher obviously had lots of skills and uh, the point here is that um, the child talk about, uh, you know, young people in Germany at the beginning of the Second World War who had to join movements like uh, Hitler's youth and how his grandmother was uh, losing her friends who were disappearing and how at the end of the war she ended up in a Russian labor camp. Uh, now, you know, you can play devil's advocate and say, well, this girl is, smi this girl is smiling, obviously, you know, uh, it's questionable if she was experiencing that, but uh, the point is that this is the story that's, uh, you know, given in the family, and this is the story that the child is presenting. And uh, I think it's important that, uh, you know, children uh, are given this opportunity to, to present narratives how they're told in their families. Uh, there is research to show that uh, children uh, experience, who are of German origin, experience a lot of, uh, you know, uh, very uncomfortable interactions in playgrounds, in classrooms, when, uh, you know, we studied first, second world war. Uh, I have a colleague who is a German teacher and she said, uh, her son told her, mom, can I please skip school for two weeks? Why? Uh, because we'll be focusing on Hitler and he just didn't want to be in school. Uh, and lots of kind of off the cuff remarks are made in playgrounds uh, when, these topics are on the curriculum. And even uh, German teachers tell me that, uh, you know, they said, thank you for raising this, talking about this. They said, you know, one of them said she had a child who told her, oh, you are very nice, even though you're German. So uh, again, it shows how much baggage there is when it comes to these historical events and how important it is that we have these narratives presented by people who uh, come from uh, that ethnic group. But also what, what is excellent here is this commonality of human experience. You have a Jewish family ending up in a, a Jewish ghetto. You have a, a, somebody from a German family ending up in a, a Russian labor camp. So, uh, you know, this is again, uh, taking away your individual freedom, uh, being uh, in a, uh, uh, sort of a concentration camp and the, the kind of the suffering of the individual, uh, the pain, the tragedy is common uh, across both groups here. And again, you know, presenting basically individuals as, uh, you know, often having to uh, make choices that will secure their survival, even though uh, they may not be happy with those choices. Uh, Talking about research and how research connects with narratives, here is a, a very important study uh, by Cole and Stewart. Uh, and uh, they are looking at uh, people from different uh, backgrounds, different countries, different ethnic groups. And uh, here is a German teacher who basically comes back to his mentor at university and says uh, that, you know, children are making comments about Nazi Germany, that, drawing swastikas calling Hi Hitler when he uh, uh, walks into the classroom uh, and he goes to his mentor to ask for help. Uh, and the mentor says, never tell the new German. Uh, and, and I think this really shows uh, that uh, we are lacking skills in all different levels of education to engage with these difficult narratives and to find ways in which uh, we can make sure that uh, individuals uh, can present their identity and, uh, uh, you know, feel positive about them. Uh, so I just want to say a little bit uh, uh, how teachers responded. Children were extremely enthusiastic. Uh, teachers told me that especially SCN children were, uh, you know, bringing different objects uh, from their culture they want to show. They were asking when is our presentation. Uh, so very enthusiastic about that. Uh, when I asked teachers to present their own narratives, they were mostly enthusiastic. I had one a teacher who was from Preston, which is a small uh, town at the north of England. Uh, and when I told him, Alan, uh, can you please do a narrative about Preston? Uh, he said to me, oh, Dina, who wants to know about Preston? <laughs> and then he... Uh, when the day came, instead of doing one lesson on Preston, he did a double lesson on Preston and he shared a lot of his uh, personal memories, music, history about Preston as a mining town. 
and, and I said to him, look, children want to know who you are when you are not a teacher. They want to know who you are as a person. And, you know, they'll probably never go to Preston, but the important thing is, is that they're getting to know you through your narrative. And they learned a lot about history of, uh, you know, uh, smaller towns uh, in England. So to finish off with, uh, I would like to highlight that there are four key principles uh, to this work. And first one is that memories are not only about past, they are a really important resource to understand our presence, uh, that our personal insights are integral to peaceful coexistence, like you know, the incidents I mentioned happening in the playground and how this can be avoided. If we structure opportunities for children to share their narratives in the classroom, uh, this type of work is also a framework which is suitable for cross-generational work. Uh, in schools in London, we had a fantastic initiative called uh, Adopt a Chelsea Pensioner. Uh, Chelsea Pensioners are veterans from different wars, and uh, they would go to school and tell their own personal narratives about being soldiers in different wars. And again, this is a very different uh, way of understanding that situation, uh, you know, which complements uh, the text we get in history books. And what's really nice about this is that every, everyone doing this project, from young children to senior citizens, they're experts uh, in, in what they present. They're experts in their own experience. And this is very important for children who are new to the curriculum, new to uh, the schooling in the UK and uh, in, in every other country, and uh, we need to give them opportunities to shine and, uh, you know, to be able to, uh, uh, you know, take center stage in the classroom, present their work and, and be the experts. Uh, and uh, to conclude with, I want to say that uh, really many years that I've been using this approach, I've seen how this approach facilitates highest learners' engagement and relevance. And uh, my recommendation is that educators at all levels, from primary to higher education, teacher trainers, should be looking to uh, employ autobiographical approaches uh, for the benefits of enhanced participation, uh, better achievement, and uh, development of intercultural competencies. Uh, Jim Cummings talks about affirmative mirror, and uh, this is really about you know, saying, can a student recognize themselves and the background in the curriculum, in what's being taught in the classroom? Uh, is our curriculum uh, an inclusive tool or does it actually alienate children? So uh, if we want children to recognize themselves in what's happening in the classroom, then uh, we need to be able to give them this mirror where they will see their cultures, their languages, their experiences. Uh, reflected back at them. Uh, and also I want to say that uh, European Council has done a lot of work on intercultural encounters and they've developed lesson plans where you can use autobiographical narratives as kind of a group work, individual work, as preparation for visits to different museums or other countries. And you can search this uh, on their website. Uh, also, uh, this uh, work has been published by the British Council as a chapter in a book, and it's available uh, on my website. Here is uh, the link with a blog that I've written, and uh, uh, also uh, you can access not just my chapter, but the whole book. And here you've got uh, this, a reference to that study, Do You Ride an Elephant and Never Tell the New German Experience of British Asian Black and Overseas Trained Teachers in Southeast England. Uh, which, you know, if you are interested in research and narratives, this is something uh, definitely you should read. Uh, and more key references, uh, but uh, we can stop there. And um, uh, Jim, uh, should I stop sharing and uh, we can see people on screen? That's a good uh, idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay, there you go. Over to you, Jim. Excellent. All right, Dina, thank you so much. And it's been so interesting to see, you know, during your talk, uh, in the chat, there was a, quite a lot of um, comments and, and kind of back and forth, and people responding really positively to a lot of the a lot of the stories that you were sharing. And I think you know there is something so personal with all of this that's so important for for us to get. And I really just want to say thank you on you know, from me and on behalf of of all these really nice comments uh, to you for sharing your story with us today. 
uh, because I think it really does help to illustrate just how valuable it is to make connections um, by, by giving it that kind of personal narrative. Um, so I think the other thing that I'm really excited about is seeing such a great example of the application of theory to practice and to seeing how all of this practice um, you know, is so nicely supported um, and it all makes sense. And we've got some really, I've got a couple of questions in the chats that are related to some practical things related to um, some of the practice. Um, but yeah, I just, I just wanted to say that I thought it was really interesting for, for those of you who are, who, who might, might have missed it earlier, but the ABC theory to the, right, the autobiographical, and then adding that dialogue aspect to the ABCD theory, I think is really important and something that it could potentially be a useful framework for researching in this area. Um, and I thought the model that you presented uh, there as well in terms of multimodal elements and encouragement of bilingual expression um, and the focus on spoken presentation and genuine audience as well as engagement of children and adults. Um, and it was interesting because Reshmi actually commented at the end uh, that she thought this kind of um, narrative and, and storytelling, you know, even sometimes Gwyneth shared a, a personal one that was quite sad. Um, that this uh, that there are opportunities for cross generational communication uh, at a personal level. So you know between children and, and and adults as well. So it's it's nice to see these kinds of opportunities um, and extending them into other teaching opportunities and other areas for exploration for research. Um, so the couple of uh, specific questions, if that's all right. Um, there was an early question from Reshmi about the age group of the children um, that you can use the questionnaire for. This, this was the questionnaire about their own um, yeah, educational experiences and understandings of expectations. Do you remember that? Yeah. So any recommendations for particular age groups for the questionnaire? Uh, well, there isn't a questionnaire as such. Uh, so it's about uh, you know, uh, deciding on what you want to use as your elements uh, to share with children. Uh, and uh, uh, I've done this uh, model in a primary school. I think uh, year six is excellent because uh, they just touch on the uh, First World War in year six and they're preparing for that huge kind of experience of leaving their primary school, leaving their class teacher and going into a very unknown territory of the secondary school. So this kind of theme of places we uh, had to or we have to leave uh, resonates very much at, uh, uh, in year six. Uh, but uh, really the kind of the, the way into working with children is just thinking, okay, uh, what elements I'm going to use and what rationale I have for each element. So you saw where I'm using uh, the elements of my photograph and uh, you know, the series I was watching when I was six years old. So that's really wanting to connect with very young children, but also that connects with everybody in education because you're looking at the beginning of your, uh, you know, schooling life. You are beginning at uh, the values that are communicated during that important year uh, and how, you know, that's kind of uh, put into some sort of a, a ritual and tradition and, and how uh, uh, children are admitted into uh, the society. So showing that, you know, from a socialist country and then getting other uh, children to share that from, from their own experience. I think this is really important and it relates to some of the other comments that people were making a little bit earlier around um, kind of, I think maybe teaching children from a very early age um, that they can use their stories that they might otherwise be ashamed of or be too scared to share um, as things, uh, you know, to make them stronger, right? To, to, as kind of um, elements of pride that may actually help them to resist bullying. You know, so it, it's interesting to think about that. I mean, you, you shared the story about the, you know, the boy from Kosovo who would punch people in response because there was no outlet for that. And so it's interesting to think about, yeah, just how young we could be starting these types of activities to get children to think about, you know, the power of, of their, their own backgrounds and how to express that in language. Um, there is, I'm going to, Katarina, I'm going to get to that question in, a, in your, your comment in a moment. There's um, one other question from Keshin about, so when you were talking about sharing um, literature and poems um, and, and things from people's kind of um, backgrounds, um, Keshin was wondering, would it be good to translate um, children's work for students? 
Uh, yes, this is what I mentioned already. Uh, I encourage children if uh, there are available bilingual books to bring them in because then, you know, you can motivate teachers to actually use those bilingual books later on and to form a bilingual library, multilingual library. Uh, but uh, if they have a poem that's very important to them, obviously it's extremely complex to translate the poem. Uh, you can say, okay, tell us what the poem is about. You know, who is the, the, the main hero in that poem? What, what is uh, the narrative that happens? So you, why is that poem important to you? Why are you choosing that poem, okay? So uh, you can give them, you know, kind of a, a way to uh, communicate the importance of it, relevance of it, and the main gist of it, if they can't do it, you know engage with translating. I mean, when you look at uh, uh, this collection of poems that I shared with you, I, I'm not surprised that, that it took 10 years for somebody, you know, who is a, a Cambridge scholar to actually did achieve that. Yeah, uh, no, that makes sense. We've got um, some more practical questions as well. Um, and Katarina's question is a really interesting one, because of course, talking about seeing how important all of this is, is great. But how do you convince um, teachers or how do you encourage teachers or policymakers to allow for it? You know, they make arguments like there isn't enough time for this in the curriculum or the benefits aren't valuable enough to warrant the amount of time that it takes. Yeah, well, I can tell you that in London, I didn't have to convince anybody because uh, all the teachers have on their, you know, targets and aims and curriculum, they have to do structured speaking. And teachers struggle to find activities for structured speaking. There isn't much of that going around. So as soon as I told them this is a presentation, you know, they have to uh, uh, give an oral presentation, they loved it. And that they could, you know, kind of cross their structured speaking activity for that term. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, I mean, I've been invited to uh, many schools to do it. And, and uh, one of the best initiatives was in Redbridge where the whole of year nine uh, did this initiative in their history lessons. Uh, and then it was, you know, again, going back to that principle of giving children genuine audience uh, was to present this work in their local community, uh, local shopping center. They also had an, uh, a, an excellent project with the local museums called Oral Histories, where children uh, went and interviewed uh, people who arrived in England many decades ago uh, as uh, you know, uh, immigrants from Bangladesh, from Pakistan, and uh, uh, this was kind of archived as oral histories of, of their community. So going back to uh, the model ABC, uh, you know, it's uh, also collecting biographies uh, in our community, and again, a, a good example of intergenerational work where young people engage with grandparents and uh, present their, their stories. This is really good examples. I think I would maybe also direct people to look at healthylinguisticdiet.com for some good examples of how this works. I'm conscious of the time, but there is one last question, if that's okay, Dina. Um, this is from Zah Zahid Hossein, um, who has, yeah, it, it, this is a really good. He says, some nations, sometimes uh, some regimes manipulate uh, the past to achieve their political gains. Sometimes they do so systematically, especially through textbooks used nationally. How can a teacher challenge such a situation, especially at a, at a place where democracy is limited or even suppressed? Yeah, this is a fascinating question. And uh, you probably all know the saying, the history is it's written by the victors. Uh, so, uh, you know, all of us who kind of uh, see ourselves as sitting in the methodology that claims interpretation of reality, uh, rather than objective truth. Uh, I think this is, uh, of course, uh, something that can be applied to history. You know, we all kind of use facts and events, but what we present is one interpretation. Uh, and there was an interesting project done between England and France where they uh, were looking at William the Conqueror uh, and what happened in 1066. And uh, what they realized, so they're looking at the same event, the same actors in that event. Uh, but what they realized at the start, uh, William the Conqueror is called uh, Guillaume the Bastard in uh, France. So <laughs> that simple fact show you how different the status and <laughs> you know, the importance of that person is in these two neighboring countries. And uh, I think, as I told you, when I saw in history, 
uh, that worksheet comparing fascism and communism. Uh, that's very sensitive, you know, I can't go to my colleague who teaches history and say, uh, look, I think this is, uh, you know, perhaps not the best way <laughs> to teach this. Uh, you know, he, he is the expert in his subject area. This is the worksheet the school's been using for many years. Who am I to come in and say, uh, perhaps this is not the best way? So uh, the way not to, uh, I'm calling that not a challenge, but to provide a complement, a counterbalance is saying, okay, that could be the official kind of discourse and, and your official worksheet, but here are the personal narratives. Here is what children experience growing up in countries that were led by communists who fought fascists. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and these are still very important issues. Uh, I was uh, in Vienna on the weekend, there was a demonstration uh, against uh, neo-fascism in Vienna. I think the threat of uh, neo-Nazism, neo-fascism, it's huge at the moment because of the crisis, because of the you know, economic downturn. This is the kind of classic setup uh, for the emergence of the hard right and, and, and fascism. So uh, we really need to engage uh, you know, uh, uh, with these issues and uh, make sure children understand uh, what happened in the past in their countries and, and how, uh, you know, and who fought against fascism where.